Happy Carbuncle for you to clarify, sir. Now, one of the greatest screen villains has been dubbed a discriminatory stereotype, according to the British Board of Film Classification. You remember him from scenes like this. The game's lost, Ming. Stop your attack on Earth and I'll spare your life. You pitiful fool. My life is not for any earthling to give or take. No. Ming the Merciless, uh, the arch nemesis of Flash Gordon, of course, has drawn criticism following a new warning from the censor that the film contains racial stereotypes that need to be caveated for modern audiences. Matt Tyndall from the BBFC said Ming the Merciless is coded as an Eastern Asian character due to his hair and makeup, but he's played by a Swedish actor. Uh, Max von Sydow. I didn't know that. Max von Sydow, wasn't he? The, he's the dude in The Exorcist, isn't he? Isn't he the, 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 the priest? Is that him? That's him, isn't it? Famous actor. I didn't realise that was him in the clip. I thought it was an East Asian character, frankly. It worked on me. Uh, I don't <laughs> I don't think uh, this is something that would happen if this were a modern production, says our man from the British Board of Film Classification, and is something we're also aware that viewers may find dubious, if not outright offensive. Ella Whelan is a columnist with Spiked Online. Um, Ella, I can almost hear the offence before you've even said a word at the moment. You must be discombobulating with this outrage in the world of film. Afternoon. Afternoon. It's funny, isn't it, that today, when we've come such a long way in terms of our sense of what's right and wrong, our sense of equality, our sense of justice among ourselves, that today we should panic so much about telling people when injustice happens. I mean, back when this was first aired, you could argue that uh, stereotypes or characterizations or prejudice might have fallen under the radar, might not have been picked up, people might have been ignorant about. You can't really argue that now. We have many, many, in fact, sometimes too many conversations focused around issues of racism, sexism, or the isms. Uh, and so the idea that audiences would now need to be told and caveated uh, and you might argue lectured to about what what the film entails and what prejudices they might see in the film is rather insulting and it's it i just can't understand it in a society when we are more free than ever before and, and more uh, progressive than ever before in terms of our mm. attitudes to things like racial prejudice yeah that I mean we should be treated like we are inherently uh, backwards about this. You can't help but wonder whether this is a, a, a hugely counterproductive measure um, on, on a variety of areas throughout our, our, our cultural landscape where we've seen uh, similar kind of stories that, that by flagging something that nobody had necessarily asked to be flagged or noticed and even those that had noticed it may well I think as most of us would have sort of intellectualized it and said well that's what it was then that's you know people used to dress up and do all sorts of things in all manner of different ways. Um, so nobody asks for something. Somebody creates an argument almost or a situation or highlights something that wasn't there before. That, that to me, just sounds like a, a reverse gear moment. Well, knowing the context of a film or a production TV series or something that was kind of a cultural moment like Flash Gordon might have been or like Gone with the Wind was, there's been a huge amount of discussion about that and the racism within that film and how you portray it today for a modern audience. It's always interesting to know the, con the historical context, the political context of a film. But you have to think, what is the... What's the angle here? Why are these caveats being put on? Why is there so much panic about it? And it's really disingenuous to suggest that this is just about understanding the film or that this is just about, you know, putting the film into context for a modern audience. What it's actually about is that there's an underlying fear among many of within these cultural institutions and among many uh, cultural commentators that audiences out there are kind of just but a bunches of sort of uh, sponges with no ability to uh, to discern and make decisions about what they're looking at, to think about what they're looking at, to contextualize, contextualize what they're looking at. And so they feel that it's a bit like the obsession with putting plaques up in art galleries. They kind of feel like they have to feed you the right message about the film rather than leaving it up to you to mm. make decisions and, and think critically. And that's the kind of elitism of old, actually, as it happens, um, that says that audi you know, ordinary people in film audiences or watching television are too stupid to figure out what's really going on. And that's just nonsense. Yeah, we the establishment know more than the, the little people. 
Well, you could put it that way. I mean, I think that the the unfortunate thing about this, or perhaps not unfortunate, but the interesting thing about all of this is there always tends to be a kind of underlying class element to this. So uh, it's very rare that you ever have, you know, that you ever have a suggestion that those who are cultural commentators or uh, columnists or journalists like myself, you know, those of, those of us who are supposedly experts um, or educated in this would have any problem with figuring this out for ourselves. It's about mass audiences uh, mass publics, working class people out there, ordinary mm. Joes and Janes who can't figure it out without a helping hand. And as it happens, um, I interviewed uh, Roddy Doyle the other day, who's an Irish author, who, and we were talking about this thing about, you know, this trend to kind of over sanitize art, film, television. Um, and he made the point that the working class has always been miles ahead of most uh, of the elites in terms of their openness to social things, to social trends, in terms of their uh, fight against racism, the fight against sexism, all that kind of stuff. So there's a heavy amount of uh, looking down the nose at people that's within this that isn't just about sort of bringing, uh, we, we all know that there's much of uh, pr you know, previous film and television that's a bit, that, that's a bit hairy that's a bit backward because you know life was different 30 yeah. 40 years ago um but only an idiot isn't able to discern between what was okay then sure. and what's okay now what what i i always find fascinating because we, we you know we had it with i think there was an mns bra story wasn't there where somebody was a bit upset about the color of a bra uh because the description it gave just uh, apparently was off offensive we've had the sainsbury's thing and you almost get, I don't know whether there's a, a person sitting in a, a, a kind of press release department somewhere who just writes the same press release and says, send this out. Because it usually contains words like, you know, we got it horribly wrong. We're really sorry. We are learning. That's the other thing that gets thrown into this, uh, but our mistakes. And we will do our best to, uh, to to try not to do this again. And, you know, we, we will make sure that we take all the correct steps to avoid uh, these outrages that, that are apparently happening. This sort of self-flagellation uh, theme that exists in these, these press releases. And yet at the same time, you'd think, bearing in mind the average person doesn't think this, regardless of what colour or gender or sexuality or anything they are, you might think those same companies that seem hell-bent on this rather parochial response would be listening to the wider audience, which the last time I looked, Ella, uh, represents sort of the views that people like you or myself and most of our listeners think, and that's that there's nothing to see here, and if there is, we'll work it out for ourselves. Why, why do you think these companies and organisations and institutions go for the, the big apology rather than the, the, the more common-sense approach? Well, it's because all you can really do when someone says I'm offended is grovel for an apology. It's a way of closing down any kind of discussion. And it doesn't just happen to corporates. It happens to people in politics. It happens to people in their workplaces. Offense is an incredibly subjective thing. What might offend you wouldn't offend me and vice versa. It's mm. it can be irrational. It can you know, it can come out of nowhere. It's not something that should be. Uh, a kind of used as a political weapon and yet it is and so you know i've you can call these kind of corporates and these uh, institutions that that kind of grovel in this kind of a way or concede to claims of offense uh cowardly but actually this is the this is the name of the game these days is that the best thing that you can do uh, to gain attention to shut down an argument to win an argument is to say that you're offended and the reason why it's important to push back on that it's not because giving offense or causing offense is, is a great thing to go around doing uh it's not but the uh, the fact is that it is having a wider effect on our ability to have open an honest discussion. So while it might be m and and a bra or a film board and Flash Gordon or Gone with the Wind or a book, you know, today, it's happening to other people on a lower level in mm. their, as I said, in their workplaces. You know, I don't like people that bash social media because I think it is just a tool that we use and it's not, it hasn't got a kind of higher power, but it is the case that I think far too many people take what is trending on Twitter and what is being commented on by politicians who, especially during the lockdown, spending most of their time on social media or commentators who've got an axe to grind, rather than actually thinking about what the wider audience is out there. And that's not just, you know, uh, supermarkets that are guilty of that uh, when they're thinking about their public image. It's also a trend of of more important things like politicians and their ability to make policies. We spend too much time thinking that Twitter is reflective of the wider world. Yeah. It isn't. You'd think, but again, you'd think most people do that. By the way, have you ever seen Flash Gordon, Ella? I haven't. No, I'm not. I'm. 
I, the, all these kind of films, I have seen Gone with the Wind, and yeah. I do, you know, I think that is a wonderful um, film. And actually, the more that you find out about the history of it, the more fascinating it becomes. Um, but these, all these, uh, there's a tendency with this kind of offence culture to also, you know, it happens to be a lot of the time people my age who might not have watched the films, who might wa- might not have watched the programmes. I mean, there was, I wrote a couple of articles of this for the Telegraph about this trend to uh, want to censor things and want to cry offence before you've even watched the film. So there was that film Cuties, I think it was, that had the dodgy poster, but actually was a fantastic film, a mm. French film. I think it was about coming of age uh, and a bunch of young girls that was kind of, people said that it was offensive before they'd even watched it. There's a new film out by Sia, the um, music uh, artist about an autistic girl, which is the character who plays the autistic girl is not autistic. And that had people calling for it to be sort of censored oh. or thought of again because, um, because of it causing offence, despite the fact that it hadn't hit the cinemas yet or hadn't hit the streaming sites yet because we can't go to the cinema in lockdown. And so there's this trend to kind of have a knee jerk reaction and say, I don't like it before you've even seen it. And yep. that's a bit, you know, that is really a bit philistine and a bit ignorant. It's the thing about offence is you are free to be offended, but what you're not free to do is to try and shut down whatever discussion is being had about that on the basis of your offence, because, uh, you know, you, you, that is not uh, appreciating freedom and freedom of speech. Indeed. Ella, thank you. Uh, it's always good to get your take on these things. Ella Whelan, uh, journalist with uh, Spiked Online, columnist over there at Spiked Online.